welcome to the Happy Mama Movement podcast. I'm Amy Taylor Cabaz, mama, journalist, coach, and founder of Mama Rising. This podcast is a space of community and collaboration. We gather stories of matrescence, motherhood, womanhood, and change told by our Mama Rising coaches and mothers around the globe in the knowing that through our stories, we can begin to heal and change the way the world sees, values, and supports mothers everywhere. So, welcome to the Happy Mama Movement. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome to the Happy Mama Movement. Today, I am speaking with author, acclaimed journalist, and mama of three, Lucy Jones. If you're in the UK, you would probably know her name and her book, which is creating such a phenomenal momentum around the work of matrescence. Her latest book is called Matrescence, The Metamorphosis of Pregnancy, Childbirth and Motherhood. And I love the way she has chosen that word, the metamorphosis. If you've been here for a while, you will know what matrescence is. But what Lucy does in her book and in the conversation you're about to hear is really help us see how in the natural world and in the ecological system around us, in our earth and the way it works, this process of metamorphosis and this process of the loss and then finding of yourself again is actually one of the most natural things in the world, if only we talked about it differently and supported each other differently and had our systems around us do it differently. I loved, loved, loved this conversation with Lucy and I know you will too. Enjoy. Lucy, thank you so much for joining me and our beautiful community around the world to talk about matrescence. Now, most of the people who have been listening to this for a while will know exactly what matrescence is, but from your point of view and all of your phenomenal research that you have done, if you were to explain what this word is to someone for the first time, how would you describe it? such a pleasure to be here Amy thank you um so I would describe it quite simply as um the process of becoming a mother um the transition into motherhood um I I was introduced to the work the word matrescence through Alexandra Sachs's um New York Times piece and I immediately bought the original book edited by Dana Raphael with the essay in um, with the word matrescence from the seventies. Um, and I found it just like, I'm sure you and all your listeners transformative. Um, so I would really just describe it like that. I mean, I like how Dana Raphael described it as um, an experience that changes a woman's identity physically, psychologically, emotionally, uh, socially, ecologically. <clears throat> um, so, and, and matrescence, it's a, it's a bit like adolescence or senescence, um, the, the metamorphosis of change. Mm. Mm. And when you found this yourself, were you a mother? Is that why you went searching for that word and what was happening with your own matrescence identity shift at that time? Yeah, so I, my first child was born in 2016. Um, I'd always wanted to have children and I was overjoyed to be pregnant and um, very, felt you know, very fortunate. Um, I didn't know very much about motherhood because I don't think any of us do because it's so hidden and invisible. Um, but my impression was at, at this point was that um, pregnancy was a experience where 
my body would be like a box um, or a kind of pot in which she would grow and then she would be born and I would I would be the same. I would mother intensely for nine months um, and then go back to work as normal and, you know, nothing would change. Um, and I found the experience of pregnancy and then birth and early motherhood so um seismic just so um bewilderingly massive um Mm -hmm. like the bigness of it felt so kind of crazy against the smallness of how it seemed to be presented um Mm -hmm. so you know classic culture in, in the UK bounce back culture you know six week check you know um yeah, you know, you're expected to be completely fine. Um, there's no kind of um, structural support, really, in terms of rituals or rites. Um, and I just, in that first year, I felt so different. I felt like everything had changed. Um, my brain, my body, obviously, um, my attention, my sense of self who I was felt like um, one of the images I use in the book is um, like when a caterpillar um, dissolves in a cocoon or a chrysalis, um, it becomes a kind of goo. Um, Although some, some things do remain. I just felt like this goo um, in a chrysalis. Um, I was diagnosed with postnatal depression as many women are. I found, I found being alone with a baby every day, very, um, isolating um quite lonely um really hard to soothe a crying baby it really you know, feeding breastfeeding didn't come easily birth was intense um I thought motherhood would be a kind of pastel hued um you know easy uh not easy but that it would be harmonious or calm um and Instead, it felt like this huge rupture. And I felt uh, very ashamed at the time of how how confused I was and disco- discombobulated. And then I read this piece in, in the New York Times by Alexandra Sachs, um, The Birth of a Mother, and came across this word matrescence. And for the first time, my shoulders just dropped and I... I felt like I could take a deep breath and just think this is what it is this is a thing this is I'm I'm not going mad or overreacting like this is a this is a transition this is um something that my culture is kind of neglecting and, and disavowing and um that that was hugely transformative. So, so my book, Matrescence, it's very much about my own matrescence. And I, you know, I say I'm only an expert on my own matrescence. Um, and in the, the book, I, you know, I bring in pieces of research that relate to myself. I'm the kind of organising principle because I could only do it like that in these years of early motherhood. Um, but um, it seems you know as 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 you and and your listeners will know that you know, we are in this time of a great flourishing of science about matrescence and early motherhood and and the caregiver brain and the parental brain and so on um so it felt like a really interesting and research subject mm-hmm. um as well as something i needed to write to try and make sense of what was happening to me Yes. Sorry, that's a long answer. No, it's beautiful. It's such a beautiful answer. And I think that's what if all of us feel when we finally find this word is it makes sense what we're finally we have a word of what we've been going through. And I want to explore with you in a moment what you found in that research because, you know, for many years now I've been speaking to people's experiences, research and understanding of matrescence, whether it's how our brain changes, what it does to our relationship, what it does to our spiritual perspective. But you and your book have brought in some even more divine, different insights that I'd love to talk to you about in a moment. But first, I love the way that you have described the words you've used to describe how our culture and society 
have ignored this. You were talking about how hidden and invisible this experience is and also just how much we have neglected to even look at and explore and talk about this experience that, you know, every single mother has been through and we all have come from mothers. It's mind-blowing that such a core part of our human experience has been so invisible and neglected. In your own research and now how you look at that now, what does that feel like to, to really recognise how invisible it is? Mm. I think it, it's been really huge for me. It's kind of upended so much of what I thought I knew about the world. Um, mm. You know, I thought that, you know, my husband and I were equal and then I had a baby um, and realised that, you know, he's a wonderful partner, wonderful father, but, you know, realised that within the institution of motherhood, um, the feminism is unrealised and um, it, within patriarchal, patriarchal motherhood, we are still um, uh, oppressed and, and I think taken advantage of and overburdened. And also, um, you know, it was, it's not just that care work and, and motherhood, mother work is devalued. For me, it was also that it, it was a very interesting experience. Like it, like the experience of being pregnant and giving birth and care, you know, raising children for me is like the most interesting experience of my life. Like very social political, very intellectually demanding, extremely difficult in the context of the kind of isolated, intensive institution of motherhood. But I kind of felt that you know, where were all the stories? Where were, where was all the drama of, like, childbirth in the the text that I read when I read, like, literature at university? Where were all these stories of the mothers? Like, where was maternal subjectivity? Like, this is the primary relationship for most people. Yes. Like, it's so interesting. It's so dramatic. It's so. Did you get an answer you know, to that question? Because I remember asking the same thing. Like, well, why aren't there whole departments dedicated to this at every university around the world? What What was your answer when you asked that? I think it's such an interesting question, Amy. And yeah, I'd, I'd love to know what you think. I think the answer is probably really multifaceted. Um, mm -hmm. I think that. Um, of the maternal has been suppressed um, in a way, particularly kind of in the post-industrial um, revolution where um, you know, pre-industrialization, um, we were in much more kind of collective care structures. Um, industrialization uh, kind of reduced the family to the fundamentals. Men were less involved in family life. Um, um, kind of kin networks were kind of split up people going into factories and, and cities and so on um and there you see the production and creation of this new can kind of maternal ideal who is kind of sentimentalized um um self-sacrificing the kind of angel in the home um mm -hmm. and definitely where i am in, in the uk with that idea of your role um is is it feels so prevalent and actually i think you know, in our in our um, contemporary um, in our modern day, that that idea of you know the, the self sacrificing woman who raises children is perhaps and this is something that Andrea O'Reilly has argued really well. You know, it, it's it's almost even more powerful now after women kind of won uh, rights to get into the workplace. Feels like in order for society to um, um, keep women doing most of the work in the home we have to have this like very um very strong like super mum maternal myth it kind of mm -hmm. keeps us in check keeps us feeling guilty keeps us not asking for change um so I guess that's one of it and then I think you know we look at second wave feminism um you know Second wave feminists won so many rights for 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 some women, um, but there was this like matrophobic, um, 
kind of sense of needing to detach women from maternity in order to kind of win equal rights with men and I think through that process something was lost or you know that the experience of being like an emb- embodied um the embodied experience of pregnancy birth early motherhood is kind of inconvenient um yes um so I think I mean for me in my like liberal feminist upbringing it was there was nothing about motherhood you know it was all about breaking the glass ceiling being a mm-hmm. girl boss um mm-hmm. all that you know, it just felt it was so absent um maternal that's why like I feel really excited that there seems to be this you know and as I say you've been part of it for years this fifth wave of yes. bringing you know the maternal into the public again and into into feminism and um trying to um you know keep fighting for equal rights but also recognizing that you know some women do want to be at home looking after their children and you know there's you know it's it's you can't really be equal within within the experience of maternity it has to be something more clever and more nuanced absolutely and I think you know, you and I briefly spoke about this, there does seem to be a wave of momentum around this at the moment. Um, I have been talking about this for a number of years and the difference, even just because post-COVID, finally there's this, um, there's, there's this, I don't know, there's this rumbling, it feels like, um, like the early days of the big change, the big movements where the people on the ground are starting to talk about it and then talk to each other and then others are noticing it. And then we have books like yours published where it's actually acknowledged in the mainstream press that there's something going on. And then workplaces are starting to hear it and making noticing these rumblings. I feel like where where something's changing and it's incredibly exciting, but it's huge. It is absolutely, it's like turning the Titanic in a way, sometimes I feel. The level of change that is going to be needed so future generations of of mothers know what this is but experience it differently is huge. Absolutely. It really Mm -hmm. is. And I think that um, one of the things that I've noticed um, since publishing Matrescence, it was published in the last summer in, in the UK so I've had a lot of correspondence from from women since um which has been incredibly gratifying um and you know so much the impression I'm getting is that so many women have felt very silenced very shamed very and this is this was my experience too like I felt so ashamed that I was finding this experience, which was meant to be the best experience of my life and the, you know, the defining moment of like, you know, in, in terms of, kind of conservative patriarchal thinking of, of being a woman. <clears throat> and every day, I, I mean, I, I love my baby so much, but I found the conditions within which I had to mother her. I, I just didn't feel like I'd evolved for it. Like my nervous system felt utterly overloaded. Um, and I think like, you know, that shame, which other people feel in different ways, it stops you connecting with people. Um, and I think that actually we're even at a stage now where breaking those feeling rules, which is like Ali Hofskald's um, phrase, the, you know, the feeling rules, which we have, that's actually a really big deal to mm-hmm. be able to, um, you know, say be able to express your anger or your discontent with the institution of motherhood without feeling like you're complaining about your child you know I think that like Adrian Rich's concept of like delineation of the experience of motherhood with the institution of motherhood is so helpful yes because none of us want to complain about our beautiful perfect children um it's not that it's yeah. it's something different it's the it's the institution it's the yes it's the structures and the systems but I think we've even got quite a long way to go before women feel you know there's something weirdly oppressive about modern motherhood and it must be you know I mean I'm sure 
you have you'd have something to say about this but like comparison and social media and yes. the tenets of intensive motherhood being so intense um i i just think there is this like collective reservoir of power and rage and connection just like waiting to i know, you know and maybe it's already spilling you know <laughs> It gives me goosebumps. It's like when it, well, you know, circling back a little bit to why we were saying before why this isn't spoken about, why aren't there institutions dedicated to this, why aren't there universities studying this, I almost feel like that's part of the answer, Lucy, because if you start to talk about it and tap into it and open the door and get women's voices, mothers actually be able to voice this, holy hell, watch out, it is going to come. And I feel like that is also known at some level in our culture and society, that there is there is a rumbling, an anger, a, an isolation. And if that begins to be changed and invited to be spoken about, I mean, it's why I say, and it sounds melodramatic, but I deeply believe it, you know, matrescence has the potential to change the world. Because if we start talking about this, guess what else we're going to start talking about? Guess what else we're not going to be ashamed to say out loud? Oh, now that gives me goosebumps. <laughs> I, I feel the same. And I t- I t- it, that's so beautifully put. Um, because I think like, if you look at matrescence and if you look at how our societies treat the vulnerable, how our societies consider um dependence interdependence interconnectedness care it's very revealing um you know on so many levels in terms of um racial class socioeconomic um discrimination and disadvantage it's like a kind of it illuminates the kind of dark corners of our society and shows it up for what it is and I really think it can trouble so many of the ideas that our culture and society cling to and that just aren't serving us anymore. You know, like hyper individualism, mm-hmm. um, kind of, you know, ideas of like, infinite growth, ideas of kind of the nuclear family, um, and the kind of fundamental philosophy that at least I feel like I marinated in in my culture and society of self-sufficiency self-reliance you're not needing anyone um you know very focused on kind of consumerism and getting ahead and competition um and this sense as well that we are apart from nature and we are above nature and we have uh, evolved out of our kind of wild selves and you know once you give birth um you know that that's not true you know that we're animals and actually we are just like other animals and that we need each other in fact we need each other more because we're humans and we're social animals um and the kind of powerful leading structures which want to separate and exploit us and have done for centuries really since the enlightenment and so on which also underpin predatory capitalism colonialism imperialism with a sense of superiority and hierarchy and domination Yes, but I feel that this matrescence and you know thinking about what it's like to be de- our dependency, facing up to it, could be very powerful and troubling of these ideas that are. That's right. Long. That's hold. It feels like it's holding it all together. So let's bring in the the natural world. Um, One of the beautiful things and one of the, I think, uh, unique contributions that your work has made in this space as far as my uh, research and reading has has done is looked at the natural world, the ecological system, animals, the different ways that this transformation, this um, change that we experience as mothers has is is honored and recognized and processed in the natural world so can you explain to our readers the rabbit hole that you went down in that way and what you found yeah I'd love to thank you um so I'm um, mostly a kind of science um, environment nature type health writer 
um, my previous book was a book about nature and mental health, and I'm just a complete um, like wildlife nut, and I'm, I'm <laughs> like happiest in the woods, looking at moss and like and so on. Um, uh, I've always been obsessed with nature, well, in my adult life, and um, before I became a mother before my matrescence I um I was very attracted to the idea of kind of natural motherhood natural parenting natural birth you know breastfeeding um that I would naturally know how to mother um like that idea was very appealing to me um and actually the my experience was quite different it was you know birth was this pretty brutal um violent experience breastfeeding didn't really work out I had like physical issues which meant I couldn't exclusively breastfeed which I felt a lot of shame about um my baby cried for hours every day she probably had to call it um and it was a real awakening for me because I was like well this is natural actually you know there's violence in nature and you know na- nature is cesareans are natural and um you know cuckoos pushing birds out of nests is natural and um it kind of gave me more of a like kind of gothic almost punk sense of the natural world and what I would do is I would read I read like these science magazines I never find anything about the maternal experience really sometimes about a bit about postnatal depression but you know it's so lacking everywhere um But I'd always find myself drawn to these particular um, moments of change and process in the natural world. So, like I said before, I became really obsessed with this idea of goo in a caterpillar, uh, in a a cocoon, in a chrysalis, because I felt that I was undergoing this huge metamorphosis and it felt so uncomfortable. I had no idea who I was and everything felt so new in like, this bizarre way where I felt like my culture was saying to me, you know, back to normal, look normal, get your body back, um, get back to work and so on. So because I couldn't find those narratives really in our human culture, I just grounded myself in those moments in the natural world. So the cocoon, uh, volcanoes and how how um, unpredictable and violent they are. Um, spiders who eat their own mothers um you see squirts that go through this number of metamorphosis and it's unclear which is the actual one um so i i basically um uh, i thread these ecological vignettes through the book um because they helped me to understand myself in the wider earth and realize that actually process change is a hallmark of the world um and it's normal and it's natural and it, it's going to happen and it's probably going to feel weird um but that's okay um and then i guess the other reason was um the, my matrescence was like the the most ecological um experience of my life i understood for the first time really how um how you know i was a ecological i was a being in relationship with other people um and i was really i needed people i and and my of course my baby needed me and i i just kind of saw this these threads of um uh connections in, in a different way um and that also went as well in kind of socially i found myself very um in those early months of feeling so open and so vulnerable and so paranoid and, you know, sensitive to judgment, sensitive to anything, you know, I really realized that, you know, how, how social like my brain was in terms of being influenced by other people. Um, and, you know, even these ideas like, Oh, I I had this idea that I had to be this like completely self self sacrificial mother you know always there um that there was no capacity for love as a mother you know I had to unlearn all these ideas um so the ecological as well was I mean it's sorry it's a bit long-winded answer but it was kind of trying to make a comment about how um you know we're not atoms or units we are 
so in relation with ideas and people and you know mm. all of these things <laughs> oh I love it um I have so much to reflect on that but even just picking up that last point you know it also shows us that not only have we changed but um, our environment around us needs to change and how we interact with others interchange and, and, and change through this experience. Because again, the world we live in, not only are we isolated through this matrescence transformation, but we are told that the rest of the world needs to see us the same. Mm-hmm. You know, we, our interaction with our environment can't change. And everything that you show in your book and what you've just described there again is like, but that's not how it works. When we re-emerge from our chrysalis, then, of course, the world sees us completely different. Our role is different. The way we act is different. The way we interact is different. And how vastly wrong we've got that in so many ways. And when you were describing this as well, I uh, before reading your book, I'm, I am don't, didn't know much about any of that, which was why it was so exciting and and equally soothed my own judgment of this experience even more. Uh, my eldest has just turned 16 and I am still processing the um, such the, as you would say, the, the violent and, and un, under-recognised and neglected experience that I had then. And so even reading it now, it's like there was another layer of, ah, wow, this is the way it's meant to be and this is why I felt the way I did. But before reading your work, it reminded me of just even connecting with the idea of the seasons, Lucy, was such a turning point, recognising that there is a winter and there is a summer. It sounds so simple But before going down the path of trying to understand what has happened to me, I just assumed it was all linear. You know, it's just you keep growing. And if there is a winter or if there is a death or of a season of dryness or depletion or whatever it is, then there was something wrong with me because the world has told me that it's only ever growth and it's only ever forward. And this is what is is so disconnected in what we teach our children and each other that this idea of that it is totally natural to go through these really big violent at times unsettling experiences and changes but you do emerge new so beautiful to hear you to hear you say that and when you were talking it made me think of um you know how rest is so not part of that I kind of cultural idea you know and um you know in in early motherhood kind of you know you're kind of prized if you can get get back out there and get back on your feet and and how rest is seen as um you know something lazy and 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 it's all connected I'm sure to our you know the fact that economic profit interests just govern so much of our political structures but you know rest is radical and I mean I think that's one of the like one of the most incredible things about matrescence um, for me has been being able to break out of some of, or try and break out of some of those ideas. And like you say, learn, even through, like, like, you know, if you live with children, you know that they're going through a, a, every a season, you know, every season, you know, in one day or mm-hmm. that there are these different shades and phases and, you know, that's just life it's just it's a kind of more authentic way of of seeing the world Mm, I love that when I first found this word years ago and I started to work with Dr Aurelie Athen um, around understanding matrescence and um, she really guided me to understand my own experience of it and then develop mama rising and 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 put this out into the world she said to me Amy for this to really you know, hit critical mass for this to really create movement and change. We're going to need to come to it from all different angles. We're going to need the science. We're going to need academia. We're going to need corporate policy. We're going to need books. We're going to need stories. We're going to need, you know, all of the different layers of approaching this for it to finally change the way we look at motherhood 
Um, and that's why, why when Dana Raphael first, you know, looked at this and created this understanding of matrescence in the 70s, it didn't take off is because now is the time where we need all of these different approaches. And it feels like that's what your work is doing as well. It's come to it from yet another unique uh, insight, another beautiful way to understand what is happening. And, and we all need to be doing this in our own way. We need to be having these conversations about this in all different ways, in all different corners of the globe and all different languages and in all different understandings so we can really create this change. So um, I want to say thank you. Your book was part of that for me to understand this in a different way and I know it's been received like that in so many places around the world in the same way. So thank you for, um, for being a part of this wave together. This is how we do it. That's really lovely to hear, and um, yeah, I think that's so. It's so. It's, it's this wave, isn't it? And you know, there's lots of artists and there's filmmakers yes. and there's like, know, it's so exciting. You know, it, cartoonists and um, yeah, it, it's it's time for change. It's, it's time for change. It's happening. Here it comes. <laughs> Thank you so much again. I will put all the details in the show notes of how you, people can find your book and your work, depending on where you are in the world. And thank you again for this amazing conversation, Lucy. It's such a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thank you, as always, for being here and listening to these conversations of matrescence and motherhood. There really is a movement happening. Change will take time, but the more we share these conversations with each other, speak to each other about matrescence, send the links to these podcasts to your friends and to your sisters and your community, the quicker this change that we so desperately need will happen. So please, if you have a moment, subscribe to this podcast on your podcast player, leave a review, share it with your friends. This is how we get the word out there. And as always, click on the show notes to see where you can read and access Lucy Jones's work and let us both know on Instagram and on social media how this interview impacted you. Thank you for being here once again. See you next week. And if you would like to work with a coach on your own experience of matrescence, please go to mummarising.net and explore our directory of phenomenal coaches, workshop leaders, space holders and facilitators around the globe. You can also explore our Global Matrescence Foundation and consider donating so a mama in need can access the support of one of our coaches and still ensure that our coaches receive the income and support they need so they can continue to work in this way. And finally, if you would like to be a coach, a facilitator and a matrescence activist in your own community, jump on our wait list for our next intake of the Mama Rising Facilitator Training at mamarising.net. Thank you for being here and being part of this movement. Until next week, bye.